everyone, it's Jack from Cultaholic.com and there's even more wrestling news to talk about here at Cultaholic. We've got various different pieces of news, some involving Vince McMahon, who's always a fascinating character to talk about, some involving other things from elsewhere in the world of wrestling. So, without any further ado, let's take a look at those lovely headlines. First of all, we take a look at reports that Vince McMahon has tipped a performance center recruit for main event future stardom. Next up, staying with Vince McMahon, we take a look at the background behind that bizarre segment to close last week's SmackDown. And finally, one of WWE's recently released superstars has said they already requested their release two months earlier. First of all, let's go to a story from WrestlingNews.co who say that yes, there is indeed a Performance Center recruit in the Performance Center who Vince McMahon has apparently seen and thought, wow, he could really be something in the future. And the man in question is a superstar named Cal Bloom, the son of a man named Wayne Bloom, who you may know better as Bo Beverly of the Beverly Brothers. And even if you're not familiar with his dad, you might be familiar with Cal himself without even realizing if you watched last week's SmackDown because he was actually on the show getting, you know, immediately squashed by Sheamus. Apparently it was at this SmackDown that Vince saw Bloom in the ring for the first time and remarked according to sources, according to WrestlingNews.co, remarked that, oh wow, this guy could really be something. One unnamed source has said that everyone is comparing Bloom to a young Edge. He is rough around the edges, but he has something, and Vince thinks he can be a big deal, but it'll take some time. The source also says that Vince feels that Cal Bloom has the right sort of size and the right sort of look. No surprise, they're two big priorities for Vince McMahon, and also uh, apparently feels like he moves around the ring well, despite his relative lack of experience. And apparently the coaches at the Performance Center also echo Vince's sentiment. So it seems like this guy has a pretty bright future ahead of him if he continues to develop as WWE think he should. So good luck to Carl Bloom. I mean, this isn't quite the same level of this is the next chosen one as it was when Vince said the same about Drew McIntyre back in the day. But obviously, sometimes being the boss's favorite or the person that the boss thinks really has a bright future ahead of them, sometimes that can be more of a task to overcome than a benefit, I suppose, because now the expectation is upon Carl Bloom, of course, if these reports about Vince's opinion are to be true. But also, again, looking at the case of Drew McIntyre, even though that did prove to be too big an obstacle for him at the time, it provided a platform for him to go away, really improve himself and come back. And now, of course, he's WWE champion. Of course, I'm going way too far ahead here in my assessment of Carl Bloom because I've only seen that match against Sheamus as well, but Let's just wish him all the best of luck for the future, and maybe we've got another main eventer on our hands. Next up, staying with the topic of Vince McMahon, let's talk about that Vince segment that ended SmackDown on Friday night. Now, for those who didn't see, it was meant to be a celebration of like 25 years of Triple H. He and Shawn Michaels did basically a comedy skit in the ring where people from Triple H's past and present were calling him up, and you know, it was all quite jokey. It was all quite lighthearted. Stephanie was cracking jokes. Ric Flair was cracking jokes. And then Vince came out, and Vince cut what can only be described as, I think it's fair to say, a, a rambling promo. Uh, it didn't seem too tightly scripted. It was more just a loose collection of anecdotes and zingers aimed at Triple H about some of the more cringeworthy moments of his past. Unfortunately, it wasn't, I mean, the joke wasn't really on Triple H. It was more the talking point afterwards was more, what is Vince doing? Vince mentioned, you know, the, the Katie Vick segment and the Bailey, this is your life segment for some reason. Maybe that was Triple H's idea. I don't quite understand what was going on there. And basically it was almost like he was attempting to do a bit of a roast of Triple H. But yeah, it was, it was odd. Now, according to Sean Ross Sapp of Fightful, that segment was pre-taped. Uh, that makes a lot of sense. You know, it didn't seem very scripted. It seemed to run longer than 10 minutes. I don't know if they trimmed it down for the final broadcast. And if they did trim it down, it still came across quite weird. But apparently the segment was only originally meant to go for 10 minutes, but when they taped it, Vince went for closer to double that length of time. He was clearly really enjoying himself ripping into his poor son-in-law. It also begged the question at the time, why on earth is Vince there? What's he doing given the current circumstances and the fact that he is indeed older? Uh, but then again, he did maintain social distancing, at least from what we've seen on screen, because he was at the top of the ramp. They were all the way down in the ring, so hopefully, Everything's fine. But now let's talk about the story behind this segment. This is courtesy of WrestleVotes, one of those kind of insider Twitter accounts who, to be fair to them, have been pretty accurate in the past. They recently posted up a screenshot of a text message on Twitter from one of their sources who said, this is what he's been like the last two weeks or so I'm seeing. This is the pandemic, mania getting canceled, XFL getting killed. It's all finally got to him and he's at the F it part of it all. Screw it, Vince could be wild. And yes, of course, it has been a pretty tricky few weeks or months for 
Vince to overcome. But then again, it's been a tricky few months for everybody. So I don't know how much sympathy I've got from there. To be fair, I hadn't attempted the start of a football league and had that shut down. So I can't quite operate on the same level of stress that Vince can. However, yes, according to WrestleVoters source, this is, this is what Vince is like now. This promo that he cut on Triple H is quite representative of how he is at the moment, which seems to imply that he's kind of all over the place, changing his mind quite a lot of the time. He's a little bit incoherent sometimes. So I don't know what the difference is. But this story has also kind of been corroborated by Mike Johnson of PW Insider, who reported last week that Vince being in a bad mood has become sort of a running joke in WWE, and employees have been doing the sort of stuff like waiting in their car or walking the long way around the building to avoid like making eye contact with him and having to talk to him, just because he's in such a bad mood. This is according to Mike Johnson of PW Insider. So yeah, hopefully Vince is doing okay, but hopefully also, you know, the WWE superstars are doing okay, because we hear reports all the time of how difficult a backstage environment it is to work in in WWE. Yes, you've got friends and everything, and yes, you're living this incredible dream, but at the same time, we've heard frustrations with the likes of creative, trying to get yourself a spot, trying to get a certain storyline over, because, you know, at the end, everything, the buck stops with Vince, and it's sometimes hard to get through to him, it seems. And with him in this mood, you know, you can imagine the morale is pretty low backstage, or at least I'm, I'm assuming so anyway. So hopefully, hopefully Vince is fine, but also hopefully all of the superstars are fine as well. Next up, let's talk about Jerry LeKing Lawler, who addressed a recent controversy on his podcast. So let's go all the way back to the April 13th edition of Monday Night Raw, when, if you remember, or if you saw this on social media blow up afterwards, Akira Tozawa hit a senton onto Austin Theory, and Lawler on commentary called it the ramen noodle moonsault. Now, obviously, everybody was a little bit like, what's going on? It's 2020. What are you doing, King? Uh, everybody was pretty annoyed with him on social media. Um, not least because it was a senton, not a moonsault, but also, of course, because of, I think, the attempted racial connotations of the comment. Now, Lola has addressed this on his podcast, explaining that this is a thing that he's been doing for a while, apparently, but this might be the most stark example of it, I suppose, saying that his ignorance towards move names comes from his time working with Mauro Ranallo when Ranallo was starting out on SmackDown in 2016. Lola said it was his way of almost, I guess, in a, in a sort of heenan gorilla, monsoon attempted kind of way, trying to strike up a bit of argumentative banter between himself and Morallo because Morallo has got this huge knowledge of Japanese move names and everything, and Lawler apparently wanted to deliberately get the names wrong to annoy Mauro, and then he would do the, the equivalent of like, will you stop? I, I think that's what Lawler's saying he had in mind. Lawler says, I would say something like, there's the ramen noodle moonsault, and he would say, okay, oh, you know there's no such thing, and we would just go on. I was doing it just to play devil's advocate with Mauro. If I was still doing commentary with Michael Cole or JR, we had the chemistry where each of those guys would have known that I was almost making a fool out of myself by claiming like I was acting like I knew what this unbelievable looking move was. He goes on, then either Cole or JR would have said, oh, King, you know better than that. With Byron and Tom, we don't have that chemistry yet. We've only been working together for a short time. So when I said that, they didn't even acknowledge it. So it kind of went out and they just kept talking and I kept talking. I didn't think about it either. Lola then did talk about, as I mentioned a bit more about Bobby Heenan and Jesse Ventura and great heel color commentators who, um, I think he's trying to say deliberately make a fool of themselves so the audience knows to be on the opposite side to them. And I do agree with a lot of his points here and it does sort of make sense, but I think the overriding thing should be let's not say those sort of things anymore. You, there, are, there are different and I guess more sensitive and less controversial ways to make this same point and try and have the same effect with your commentary but you don't need to go in that direction with it. And I have no doubt that a commentator as experienced and as creative as Jerry Lawler over the years can think of these ways to do it. Of course he can. But then again, I think this time he expressed it in the wrong way and was rightfully called out for it. But at least this explanation gives, I guess, sort of some degree of understanding as to why he said it. And now let's talk about Tainara Conti. Conti, of course, well, if you're not familiar with NXT, Conti was a member of the women's division there who seemed to show a lot of promise. She seemed to have a lot of charisma. Didn't quite get a chance to showcase that a lot in the ring. She had a few decent matches, but she never had that big showcase match. I don't think she ever appeared on a takeover, for example. And she was one of the superstars recently released in this big wave of releases uh, that have happened recently. And she's since spoken about it in quite some detail on her YouTube channel. Condi cleared up some rumors and some strange stories that were quite difficult to unpick from a few months ago. So let's take a look at what she said. She said, first of all, I want to say that I'm okay, I'm happy, I'm healthy. More importantly, I'm so excited for the future. As you guys know, I don't work for WWE anymore. I was with the company for two and a half years or so, maybe a little bit more. Honestly, that was the most crazy and amazing opportunity of my whole life. And I will always be grateful because WWE changed my life 
for the better. She talks about how she didn't know English, she didn't really even know what wrestling was, and in just two years it's been kind of a whirlwind experience and she's had this most amazing journey, which is great to hear. It's great to see that she's adopting a positive outlook on what could have been taken as a negative situation. But she goes on, in the last couple of months, uh, I was not feeling like that anymore. I was just not happy. As you guys know, I have a background in judo, so I'm always competing with myself and I need to feel that I'm growing. Uh, that I have space to grow, that I'm useful, and I was just not feeling like that anymore when I talked to them. She says, we tried to figure it out and I was just not happy and I'm like that. Uh, when I'm not happy, I try to change. If I can't change, let's just go, let's move on. She said, I asked for my release, now this is important, she said, I asked for my release about two months ago and they were not able to give it to me by then and I had no option but to try again. And it's just crazy once again how quickly WWE's policy has just totally flipped 180 in just the past couple of months, well the past couple of weeks even, uh, because back then they were letting nobody go and now they've obviously released quite a lot of people. But she goes on, then in the middle of the pandemic I was at home and then I got a call saying hey Tay, bye, <laughs> they've released me. Of course it was a shock, I was upset, I was nervous, but you know now that I've figured out everything I'm happy because I want to have good feelings about WWE in my heart and I will always have that. So there we go, it does indeed appear like Tanara Conti requested her release two months ago. That explains what happened, because at the time it was reported that she'd been released, then she started showing up at NXT live shows with a t-shirt that said released on it, and it seemed very much like it had been a work, like it was a whole storyline. But then, it seems now from this revelation from her that it was basically a shoe, she actually did ask for her release, that was then turned into a work for the purposes of a storyline. A storyline which, unfortunately, never really got a chance to go anywhere. But we would like to wish Tanara Conti all the best for the future with whatever she chooses to do. Hopefully she can find her feet somewhere. It seems like she's totally raring to go, so that's, that's pretty good stuff. In terms of recommended matches, why not? Because they're both featured on SmackDown's final segment, right? Why not go and watch that Vince McMahon versus Shawn Michaels match? Why not do that? Thank you very much for watching this news video. I've been Jack from Cultaholic.com. Stay safe out there, and I'll see you very soon.